God desires that we do the right thing the right way, not the wrong way. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery television program. We learn that the end does not justify the means. That's right, we're gonna talk about that and more today. Plus, Corey is here to tell us what she's doing. Corey? I'm going to be taking a look at signet rings today. Ryan? Well, as promised, today I'm continuing my study on Neanderthal man and how they've broken evolutionary and cultural stereotypes. All right, very good. I look forward to that. We'll talk more about that later, Ryan. Janice, what do you do? The church and our foundation. All right. Our foundation, the church, the church being the people, not the buildings, but the people. Very interesting. Okay. All of this we're going to study in the next half hour. So get ready. Take your Bible guide, turn to today's passage, and let's find out about doing the right thing the right way. Haggai 2, verses 15 through 23. And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days, when one came to a heap of twenty ephahs, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw out fifty baths from the press, there were but twenty. I struck you with blight and mildew and hail in all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day forward, from the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day I will bless you. And again the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the twenty-fourth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Haggai chapter 2, verses 15 through 23. Haggai 1 and 2, this is a great, great prophet, I'll tell you right now. Uh, th this is an interesting time in history. And the prophet Haggai, he challenged the people in Jerusalem to return to God. He urged them to take a good look at the way they were living and to change to please God according to his laws. Haggai spoke to them about the holiness of God and how God desired the people to be holy too. Now Haggai was living after the time of the exile when people had returned to Jerusalem, an interesting time. And the people strove to rebuild the temple. They needed reminders to pay attention to God's ways. Now the temple, believe it or not, was not the most important thing, but the people's faithfulness was. The temple was not, but the people's faithfulness to work on it was. When we consider the ways of God today, we're under the grace of Jesus Christ. Things are very different now than they were before Jesus walked the earth. Still, it is critically important to hear the word of God and to seek to do his work the right way. You know, there's nothing worse than doing the right thing the wrong way. Nothing worse than that. This is something that God does not tolerate, doing the right thing the wrong way. A lot of people have talked about this in all kinds of different aspects of our society. 
But there is nothing worse than violating one law so that you can get another law fulfilled because now you're prioritizing the law. That's a major problem, I'll tell you right now. Very, very interesting. Anyway, as we talk about our sin was paid for, I want to talk about God because God is good. Now take your Bible guide, turn to today's passage, and if you don't have a Bible guide, I'm going to ask the question as I always do. Why not? We could have sent you one. Or you could have got one. We could send you one with the address and the phone number. We'll just call us and we'll, uh, we'll show you how you can get it. Another way to do this is go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, the website, BibleDiscoveryTV.com, and click on the page, the Bible Guide page. It'll take you to a donate page. Thank you so much for your donations. And then what you can do is download the Bible Guide. That's great. Be with us in seconds. Seconds. Father, I pray today as we look at this, because this is important. Haggai was very important. Help us to see what you've done. Help us to hear your word speak to our lives. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We always pray before we read the word of God. It's very important to understand. Haggai chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, because we studied chapter 2, verses 1 to 14 last year. Verses 15 to 17, and we continue. And now carefully consider from this day forward, from before stone was laid upon stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days, when one came to a heap of 20 ephahs, there was but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw out 50 baths from the press, there were but 20. I struck you with blight and meldew and hail in all the labors of your hands, yet you did not turn to me, says the Lord. You didn't turn to me. You see, God desires that we learn how to do the right thing the right way. The right thing the right way. What I want to say is the end does not justify the means. What? Are you serious? Absolutely. The end does not justify the means. It doesn't. God is a miracle working God and creatively he can do anything when he's involved. But we have to get people involved that know the Lord. That's important in our society. You can think about a lot of, there's a lot of things going through my mind right now. You can think about a lot of things. Haggai 2, verse 18. Watch this now. Consider now from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed still in the barn? Now, now he's, he's asking the question. Is the seed still in the barn? And yet the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have not yielded fruit. But from this day, I will bless you. What? Absolutely. God blesses those who truly attempt, those who truly attempt to follow his right ways. God is not a legalist who loves to destroy those who do not conform. Our attitudes must seek him. The way we are, how we live, must seek the Lord. This is so important. I, I wish I could go on a preaching journey for another 20 minutes here, but I only have two minutes and 50 seconds left. So the truth is that we need to understand God performs miracles even today in our situations. Very important. Now we go to Haggai chapter two, verses 20 to 23. Watch this. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will. I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and the riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shatel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, 
says the Lord. I've chosen you, says the Lord. Which brings me to the third point. God will return and make things the way they should be. The Lord is coming back. Let's be ready for his return. The Lord is coming back. Let me tell you something. As we conclude this teaching, we need to understand there's going to come an end to this time. It's going to come to an end because God put time in the beginning and now he has time for the end. He has an end of time and he's coming back. And when he comes back, the question you're going to have to answer, whether you're dead or alive, you're going to have to answer this question because when you're, when you perish, that's not the end. When you're dead, are you going to have to answer, who did you say the Lord Jesus Christ was? Jesus Christ, that's the Lord. There's nobody on this planet who will not face the reckoning of who Jesus Christ is. My prayer today and my desire today is to see as many people as possible know the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to him and to pray and say, Father, forgive me of my sin, and there is sin, and I have it. Help me, Lord. And it's a personal prayer. You don't pray this in front of everybody else. But you pray this personally. Forgive me of my sin and make me your servant. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' wonderful name, this is what I ask today. And help me, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit to live the life because it's a unique life. And help me to live it today. Amen. Hi, Rod Hember here. We go through the Bible every year from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. Now you can join us and watch at the time you like by searching Bible Discovery TV on the Roku box or on Amazon Fire TV. Anytime you want to watch us, we're there. Get a hold of it. Watch us anytime you want to. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today in my segment, I'm actually continuing on with Friday's study of Neanderthals in which it was demonstrated that they were full-fledged human beings just like us. And today we continue to break cultural stereotypes as we examine Neanderthals' cultural inventory. Now, it's a bit of a longer segment today, so let's get to it. Since their discovery in the 1850s, Neanderthals had, up until recently, been regarded by the majority of evolutionists as more of an animal rather than a human being. One of the main reasons for this was due to their seemingly sparse cultural inventory. However, claiming that Neanderthals or any such group is subhuman just because they apparently lack cultural inventory is a completely invalid assumption. This is obvious when we consider that there are modern era people groups such as Aboriginal Tasmanians or nomadic tribes living today in Africa who until recently have had a very limited cultural inventory, arguably less advanced than that of Neanderthals, yet no one denies their humanity. Probably then, Neanderthals' so-called inferior cultural inventory is a reflection of their hunter-gatherer lifestyle or possibly due to a loss of technology rather than a reflection of their cognitive abilities. Even so, over the years it has been realized that Neanderthals did in fact have a quite impressive cultural inventory and possessed cognitive abilities at least on par with modern Homo sapiens. For example, we now know that Neanderthals had human language, symbolic communication, and even abstract thinking. They had tailored clothing and footwear demonstrating that they had the ability to sew, they made ropes and cords with their knot-making skills, and being expert hunters of large game meant that they were clearly able to strategize beforehand their plan of attack. They also crafted sophisticated stone and bone tools, as well as multi-part or hafted weapons. Remains of fireplace hearths reveal that they had controlled use of fire, and the fact that they had highly varied diets, could cook and fillet their food, as well as dry out fresh meat, shows that they were experienced chefs to boot. Also, although Neanderthals are generally always thought of as cavemen, in what is yet another breakaway from cultural stereotypes, they didn't always live in caves. In fact, some constructed shelters or windbreaks as dwellings. 
But interestingly, those who did choose to live in caves often partitioned their dwellings into different living floors and spaces. But their greatest technological achievement was their ability to synthesize pitch from birch bark through the controlled use of fire. They would use this pitch as a type of adhesive to haft tools and weapons. But experts are at a loss to explain just how Neanderthals were able to perform such a sophisticated process, recognized by chemists today as dry distillation. Of course, as human beings, Neanderthals weren't just physical creatures, but like us, they too were spiritual. They cared about things like music, beauty, and art. This is seen through their use of jewelry and cosmetics, as well as their production of cave art, sculptures, and musical instruments. Yet their single most defining human feature was their care for the injured, weak, and elderly, and the ceremonial burial of the dead. Only humans bury their dead, and this single discovery would be enough to put the final nail in the coffin of the evolutionary and cultural stereotypes of Neanderthal man. Neanderthal, like every human being, was no animal, but rather was specially and uniquely created in the very image of God. So I hope this brief two-part study on Neanderthals helped to dispel the myth that they were something less than human. The reality is, is that there is no difference between modern humans and Neanderthals. In fact, many evolutionary experts themselves have come to believe that, and that the term Neanderthal should be dropped, and that they should just be called Homo sapiens like we are. And I 100% agree. But we need to be aware of how and why this false view of Neanderthals arose in the first place. It was due to an evolutionary worldview. Believe it or not, your starting assumptions have a huge effect on how scientific data is interpreted. And even though many evolutionists today would now agree that Neanderthals were fully human, we need to realize that they were very wrong about this in the past. And so it begs the question, what else are they wrong about? And it's a really important question. But there is a solution to all of this. Rather than look at everything through the evolutionary lens, which is false, we need to view the world through the lens of God's word, which is right and true. When we do this, things become clearer. If scientists had initially viewed Neanderthals through the lens of scripture, they would have immediately realized that they were human beings just like us, and that they were post-flood and probably post-Babel people who lived in some very harsh climates. Now, unfortunately, I'm out of time for right now, but I highly recommend you check this out for yourself using the lens of truth. I call that the Bible. Uh, you can also find it uh, today and Friday segment on our website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com in video and in article form. And I also know the Answers in Genesis ministry has some great articles about Neanderthals on their website as well. So I encourage you to check all that out. Yeah, Answers in Genesis is a very important connection as well to help us understand that because they have scientists involved in all of that. Mm -hmm. It's great. They have the Creation Museum and the Ark uh, Encounter, Encounter yeah. which is just amazing. Anyway, um, that's good stuff as well. Corey? All right. Well, today I'm going to be focusing in on Haggai chapter 2. And in verse 23, uh, it talks about how Zerubbabel will be made the Lord's signet seal. And this has some really interesting symbolic meaning that we're going to talk about after we take a look at seals in general. Take a look. In the times of the Bible, documents like peace treaties, sale of land certificates, business transactions, adoptions, marriages, and the like were authenticated using the ancient version of the signature, the seal. Ancient seals as we know them came in two forms, the signet or stamp type and the cylinder type. They were used to impress wet clay in any form by either stamping or rolling. Seals were miniature works of art that ranged from half to one and a half inches tall and were painstakingly carved from stone, though there are examples of glass, bone, and precious metal seals. The artists that dared to create them not only had to work in reverse for the seal to impress properly, each seal had to be unique, distinct enough to serve as a recognizable signature for its owner, as individual as the person themselves. The material or stone type that was chosen may also have had meaning, with a certain kind of stone being chosen for a perceived benefit or property. Seal artists also utilized individuality in the stones themselves to make their work stand out. There are examples of seal designs incorporating marks, splashes of color, and lines naturally occurring in the stone to enhance the seal's appeal. 
These signatures were worn in several ways. Signet types were often mounted in a ring and were either worn on the finger or hung on a necklace. Cylinder seals had a hole drilled through their center like a bead through which a mounting pin would be placed so that it could be worn in a few different fashions, most commonly in a necklace, bracelet, or on a clothing pin. Thousands of seals and seal impressions have been found from antiquity. It's believed that the oldest seal ever found is a signet type from the 6th millennium BC. Cylinder seals were in popular use in Mesopotamia from around 3400 to 400 BC. 3,000 years of prominence eventually put to rest by writing materials. Clay as a writing material was slowly replaced by papyrus paper, which would be bound and sealed with a lump of clay that was easiest to stamp. Within the heyday of the cylinder seal, however, signet seals were also in use, especially important for the Bible during the first millennium BC, the time of the kings. Seals appear in many biblical passages most often reflecting their general use of giving someone's authority to a transaction or document, but also sometimes in symbolism. Famously, in the Song of Solomon, the female speaker asks to be placed like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. This verse seems to reflect the practice of seals being buried with their owners. As seals represented the essence of their owners, they were common grave goods. So the love of the romantics in the song went beyond the here and now into the next life. So one of the reasons that this association that God makes here in Haggai between Zerubbabel and, as his signet seal, it, it it's talking about, you know, Zerubbabel having the authority of the Lord, being associated with God's presence and with God's identity, uh, with God's authority. And this is extremely significant for the post-exile community because they have come back from the exile. And if you'll remember, back in Jeremiah 22, verse 24, God uh, has the prophet say to King Jehoiachin, even if you were a signet seal on my hand, I would take you off. So we see God essentially decommissioning the Davidic line at that point, uh, which is would have been very traumatic for people who were following, you know, the theology of God because the Messiah is supposed to come through the Davidic line. So here in Haggai, God is restoring that Davidic messianic covenant with the line of David through Zerubbabel. And you'll see when we get into the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter one and Luke chapter three, indeed Zerubbabel is mentioned in Jesus's line. Son of David, mm -hmm. son of David, he was called. Very, very interesting. Um, the, the line that God preserved and made Messiah, very, very interesting mm -hmm. because all of a sudden everything comes into view. Now, uh, it is scheduled for Jesus Christ to come back. And when he comes back, he is going to rule for a thousand years. In my view, that's what I read in the Bible. So that's what I believe. And it's very fascinating how that takes place because people will still be born and still be here. Mm -hmm. That's going to be amazing. Very interesting. Thank you, Corey. Mm -hmm. Janice? The book of Haggai. We have the command to build God's house. You know, it's, it's, it's a chapter where you see Haggai really confronting God's people about making sure that their lives line up with God's direction for their lives. These are God's people. These are the people that made a covenant with their God. So he's concerned about them making sure that their lives are lined up with him, with his heart. He's also admonishing the people to work to build the temple. And if I, if I bring us down to chapter two, the coming glory of God's house, they need some encouragement here. And, and I love, rather than try to explain it, let's just read it. Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? In comparison with it, is this not in your eyes as nothing? Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel, says the Lord, and be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, 
out of bondage, so my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Now, I'm talking not from a work, a workly hands work. I'm talking about a spiritual work that God does. Those of us who follow Jesus Christ, we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that our foundation is built on him. That's where our foundation needs to be. Otherwise, when things come in, our, when the storms come, you know, it's that, that little song that we used to sing when the rains come down. Um, and it, it, when the storms come out, if our foundation is not built on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to stumble. We're going to fall. But when our lives are straight on God's foundation, we can be encouraged. It is the work inside of us that we allow God to do. When we come to him in repentance, when we make sure that our lives, our priorities are following him, that he's number one in our life, that we make time to spend with him in prayer and with time it, with him in the word of God, then we can line ourselves up and we can build on that foundation inside of us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit right now. And God promises that he is with you. He said, my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. There's been a lot of changes that we've seen in our world globally, and especially within the church in the West. We have seen a breakdown of what I would call the church and the way it is functioning in this last time of pandemic with churches not being able to meet and the like. Let's not be looking at what the temple was before and trying to mourn what it was. Let's move forward in time. Let's make sure that each one of us as followers of Jesus Christ, that our lives are lined up with God and his word, and that we move forward knowing that the spirit of God is with us and that we are going to continue on with the work in our hearts and with the things that he has called us to do. And that is the great commission. That is to share our testimonies with each other. That is to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not not be still, but let us move forward in the spirit of God.